So the killing, I, I've seen it umpteen times. I hosted it one time with Colleen Gray, who's the credited female star. And Colleen, being the honest woman that she was, said, I might have gotten the billing, but Marie Windsor got the part. <laughs> and she was right. This film has endured as one of the great heist films of all time. Period. End of sentence. Uh, the cast, once you get past Sterling Hayden and Colleen, is really a hall of fame of character actors. And that's no accident. I was doing an event at the Rancho Mirage Library last year with my good friend and colleague Stephen Smith, and I met James B. Harris. Uh, Jimmy's career uh, is much more than uh, being with Stanley Kubrick. Uh, he, he produced the Bedford Incident, and with Stanley, he did Lolita, Paths of Glory, a great filmmaker. It's a privilege to have him here, so welcome James B. Harris here tonight. This was 1955 when we made this movie. And when we finished the movie, we uh, took it back to United Artists. And, and I was really disappointed in that United Artists didn't uh, think much of it. They said they were going to put it out as the second half of a double feature. And I was so disappointed. But Kubrick said to me, uh, you just wait. It's not going to be long before this picture will be thought of as a classic. And I said, you really think so? He said, oh, absolutely. He said, uh, you'll be getting calls, all kinds of calls to do interviews. And as the producer of the picture, you'll be, you'll be so glad. You just wait and see. Well, I waited by the phone <laughs> for 68 years. <laughs> And then I finally got the call <laughs> from this guy. <laughs> Jimmy, you were the one that originally uh, got the book by Lionel White that it's based on Clean Break. Uh, how, did, how did that come about with you and Stanley uh, reading the book and making the movie? Well, the, when we Stanley... Uh, came to my office. I was distributing films for TV at the time. And, and uh, he wanted me to uh, distribute his early film, Fear and Desire, on television. Uh, but when he came to the office for us to discuss it, he, he, he was embarrassed to say that the Fear and Desire was not available. The distributor, Joe Burston, had been killed in a plane crash, and the film was tied up in litigation. And so uh, he couldn't deliver the film. And there we were in the office with, with nothing to talk about. I mean, but Stanley had, had, had recently done a picture called Killer's Kiss, right. which I had seen. He screened it for me. And, and uh, I was really impressed with the fact that maybe the picture wasn't all that great. But the fact that this young fellow, when I say he was eight days older than me at the time, yeah. so, he did everything himself. He photographed it, he edited it, he, he, he directed it, he wrote it, he did everything. And I said, my God, this is really a talent that has to be recognized. And, and I was sick of selling films for television. I wanted to, to start making films. Mm -hmm. And so uh, we decided that, that we could help each other along those lines. Mm -hmm. and, and the only thing was we didn't know what to do because we, we didn't have any projects. It was right. just at a handshake. We're mm -hmm. going to be partners. I'm going to produce, and he's going to direct. And where do we go from here? Mm -hmm. So after, after he left, I went to the bookstore, you know, Scribner's on, on Fifth Avenue in New York, and I just found a book on the bookshelf called Clean Break by Lionel White. Good, good material for a film. Mm -hmm. So I bought the book. I read it, and, and I was impressed with the, with the writing. I showed it to Stanley. I think he would have done the phone book if... if <laughs> you know, he was so the, those were the days, right? Yeah, right. <laughs> anyway, he, of course, uh, responded uh, mm -hmm. the way I did, and, and I acquired the rights, and, and we were mm -hmm. off and running. Now, the, the all up, did it cost, what, about 300000 uh, Did you have to raise the money, or did you have it? 
How did that work? The total cost of the film was three hundred and thirty thousand dollars. <laughs> that would be that would be four days of craft services now. And and we shot it in twenty four days. Wow. wow. You know, so don't think that Kubrick is is you know a undisciplined filmmaker. Oh no. I mean, if, if he had to, we only had enough money to to, to shoot for twenty four days, and right. he shot it in twenty four days. Right. Uh, it cost three hundred and thirty thousand, of which United Artists would only put up two hundred. Mm-hmm. So I had the the responsibility or the problem of raising one hundred and thirty thousand. And you were able to do that. Yeah. 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 One of the things that always amazed me about this film is the casting. To every single part, every part was so wonderful. And this was in a day before VHS, DVDs, cable, all this stuff. Uh, talk a little bit about Stanley the cinephile on how he knew exactly who he wanted to put into all these various roles in The Killing. Well, Stanley had seen uh, so many movies. You know, in those days, you didn't have DVDs, you didn't right. have tape, you didn't have anything, except if you wanted to see a movie, you had, you had to see it in a theater. Right. And so uh, you can imagine I mean, the amount of time that, that Stanley spent watching movies in theaters, because <laughs> all of these characters, mm-hmm. he was familiar with, having <laughs> seen them in previous films. Right. Uh, right. And, and Stanley always said that, that he thought that 80% of, of filmmaking is, is the casting. Right. I think John Huston said the same thing. Yeah. He, he did? Yeah, very true. Very true. Well, I guess it must be right. Then. It must be right. <laughs> Houston and Kubrick, who could argue with that, right? Yeah, it's a great parlay. So how was it? You know, Stanley was, uh, he knew photography. He had been a photographer for Life magazine. How was it? Uh, Stanley, I think, in those days was kind of a bohemian type of fellow, New Yorker, and then coming to Hollywood. What was, what was the experience of you guys coming to Hollywood to make the film? Well, we were two kids, two wise guys <laughs> from New York. New York. New and, York. And, uh, uh, you know, uh, I guess to a certain extent, we were resented mm-hmm. uh, by by people who, who, I guess, were jealous or, or envious of the fact that that we that we were able to at least get a picture made. You right. know, that's that's always been a difficult task for for anyone, anytime, anywhere. It's getting is to the raise the money made. to get a film made. Right. I mean, it's just it's it, even today it's just as tough as it's always been. Right. You know, people say. They, they don't seem to care what's it about. They're just, they're who's in it? Mm-hmm. You know that that's right. that's the most important thing. It's always been a star's market. Right. It's very difficult to get pictures made. Right. Without without some attachment to it. To right. So it was it star. was it difficult getting Sterling Hayden, who who definitely had a name? I I remember reading something that Victor Mature tried to get him. How did it work? That you got Hayden, who was kind of the the main piece to the puzzle, I guess, to get funding. Well, when we had had uh, adapted the book and finished the screenplay, which which Jim Thompson had, had right. made, made a major contribution to it, uh, I th- when I look back at it now, I think it was a bit unfair to only credit him with additional dialogue. Yeah, I I, 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 I read that he was highly irate about that, and and deservedly so. I yeah, mean, he, yeah. He he contributed an awful lot, a lot of the dialogue, which which is so amusing. I mean, it oh, really yeah. is, it's fun to listen to. Yeah. It comes right. Some of the dialogue comes right out of his books, like that beginning. I love that scene between Ted DeCourcy and Jay Adler, where he comes in and about the loan, and he goes, "Well, there ain't no use in kicking." That's right out of a Jim Thompson book. That's a classic line. Yeah, a lot of the stuff that she, that, uh, that Marie Windsor is. Showing, oh yeah, oh uh, yeah. You know her. her, yeah. her you know, yeah. being so glib with, yeah. with all of these great lines. You have a dollar sign where most women have a heart, and uh, you know, mm-hmm. sing me something from Pagliacci and all. <laughs> it was it was great, but right. uh, and but Thompson did stick with or Stanley stuck with him because he gave him a credit on your your the Paths of Glory, which was uh, I think your next picture after that, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah uh, Jim Thompson was really a, a, a really nice man. And yeah, he had a little drinking problem, but right. But so did a lot of other people. So. Yes, <laughs> a lot of laughing water around in those yeah. days. <laughs> yeah, but, but he he did the first draft uh, on, on Paz of Glory*. Right. And then we brought in Calder Willingham to 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 
do another more right. revisions. Right. Uh, but getting Hayden, that was was that kind of the big thing oh, yeah, to get the, over the hump with United well, Artists. Well, well, when he finished the adaptation, uh, and, and we had a screenplay, mm-hmm. we we called it the Day of Violence. Right. You, United Artists gave the, the title "The Killing" mm-hmm. uh, when we delivered it, but we wrote it as 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 Day of Violence, and. Uh, in those days, you really didn't have to make firm offers to actors like you do today. Mm-hmm. I mean, to get their attention and to try to get by the gatekeepers, you know, these agents. Right. You, you, to get their attention, you have to make like a firm offer. You have mm-hmm. to be funded. You have to have a start date. Right. But in those days, you could send the script to, to actors mm-hmm. and, and without the firm offer. Mm-hmm. Without the firm offer. And, and so that's what we did. We, we put about 12 scripts in a box. Mm-hmm. And we sent it to the same agent that t- sold me the rights to the to the book, mm-hmm. the film rights to the book, right? With a list of actors that, mm-hmm. that we thought could could play the lead. In those days, you know, it was Tony Quinn, mm-hmm. and Steve Cochran, mm-hmm. and and Richard Conde, and you know, people right? Didn't the wait. film noir murderers row, yeah. <laughs> and 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 uh, Sterling Hayden was on the list, right? And uh, one day I got a call from from a, an agent mm-hmm. named Bill Schifrin, uh, who represented Sterling Hayden. Mm-hmm. And he said he had read the script and that Sterling liked the script. And who's going to direct this film? Mm-hmm. So I said, oh, we have a terrific director. He's really <laughs> Stanley Kubrick. In, 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 who? Who? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Stanley Kramer. <laughs> no, 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 no. It's Stanley Kubrick. And and. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and Stanley was listening. I mean, he wasn't listening on the phone, but he was listening to, to my end of the conversation. Right. And and he was thinking about things like like uh, uh, do you remember the Kirk Douglas picture where he and Barry Sullivan were partners. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. And 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 Kirk threw threw uh, Barry Sullivan under the bus. Yeah, threw him and 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 hired and hired another the, director. The director. Yeah, and Stanley yeah. was really he didn't know me that well. You know, we were only together like a year. Right. In, in one film. So he was he, he was, was kind of waiting a to see. Nervous that, that yeah. With my money invested in this film, but if I could get a deal to get, I mean, a name director. Yeah. Yeah. But he didn't know me that well. I mean, mm-hmm. I'd never do a thing like that. I of mean, a handshake, it, you know, your, your word is your bond, and, and uh, I'd never give up on this guy, mm-hmm. you know. Good for you. He, 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 because we became, you know, I think, close friends. Mm-hmm. You, know, you get pretty close when you, when, you know, mis- misery movies. loves company. You know, <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. uh, so anyway, uh, we went running to United Artists with mm-hmm. the fact that, 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 Sterling Hayden wants to do this movie. Mm-hmm. And they said, well, you know, why don't you get, you know, a star? Mm-hmm. We said, well, how can you do better than this? I mean, John Houston just used him in Asphalt Jungle. Mm-hmm. I mean, Sterling did a he- hell of a job in that. Absolutely. And they said, okay, if, if you insist, mm-hmm. we'll only give you $200,000. <laughs> <laughs> because we, we have Sterling Hayden mm-hmm. in Westerns that we sell for flat rentals, you know, for $25. Uh, we believed in Sterling. Mm-hmm. Uh, and and we made the deal, but then I had this d- decision to make: Are we can we make it for two hundred thousand? You mm-hmm. guys said, "Don't spend a penny more; you'll never get it back." Mm-hmm. You know, if you do, you're in second position. We get our mm-hmm. two hundred first. Mm-hmm. You so know? you and Stanley, when this picture came out, you guys really didn't make any money from this. Is that correct? Well, yeah. I mean. <laughs> <laughs> To say the least, yeah. yeah. We yeah. we didn't make any money till Lolita. Well that was okay. that, you know, yeah. that that made Stanley yeah. a rich man. Yeah. But you know, Stanley you were gonna do things his way or it was the highway and I know uh, the the director of photography on this was a very accomplished uh, Luke Ballard. And didn't he and Stanley have a have a, a meeting of the minds where Stanley kinda laid down the law on how the photography was gonna be? Yeah, it, it, it was uh, an unpleasant uh, relationship mm-hmm. with, yeah. with, with Lucian. You know, he was a dandy, you know. He'd come dressed to the oh, set. Yeah. He was, I think he, at that time he was married to Merrill Merrill Oberon. Right, right. And and uh, I think he came up, I, I, he might have been the one that came up with the little light that was on the camera, which gave her the good face look because she had had an auto accident and they called it an Obi. 
Mm. Uh, that was one it's of like his creations. Yeah. yeah, yeah. But at any rate, so he and Stanley didn't see eye to eye. Well, Stanley had photographed his the two previous features, and, right. and he was a still photographer, and uh, he he had his own ideas of you know of what course. focal length lenses to use, and, mm -hmm. uh, and Lucian wasn't used to that. You know, nobody ever questioned Lucian Ballard on 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 camera setups and what right. lenses to use and, and so forth. Uh, I think it's pretty unusual. I never heard of a, of a uh, director of photography not coming to the Nellies, not coming to the Rushes. He just stopped showing up. Yeah, but yeah. you can get the Synexes from the lab and y to see mm -hmm. all you have to see to know that everything mm -hmm. was okay. Right. Uh, but it was sort of like a bonus to go to the Dailies and see it actually on the big screen. Sure, sure. But Lucian and Stanley didn't get along, so Lucian decided not to come. <laughs> Now, it was kind of, uh, in addition to your partnership with Stanley, he was married at the time to Ruth Sabatka, and uh, didn't she storyboard the whole, the whole film and draw out the scenes, or is that exaggerated? She built the sets. I mean, she was like the... the she was the uh, art director? Set designer. Set designer, okay. Yeah. I yeah. Mean, we, we, one problem with Ruth was, you know, that when we opened an office in, in New York, mm -hmm. she wanted her name on the door. Oh boy! Yeah, that, that, you know, that, that, that's I mean, that didn't make the marriage really. No, but <laughs> yeah, that's, that's yeah. Not he also used um, uh, Gerald Freed, Jerry Freed, who uh -huh. recently passed away, and and uh, I guess he and Stanley went way back and used him to compose the music, which I think helps the film a lot. He did, he did a terrific job on this film. He, he had worked with Stanley before, right? And and so we brought Jerry out to to the coast mm -hmm. to make the to, to do the music. But the thing that really I was amazed when I got to the coast and 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 with the music is that all of the finest musicians in the world were available for scale, you know, to play on the, to, right to play for the, for the uh, scoring. Right. I mean. When you heard the piano in the background on the scene you described with Jay Adler, mm -hmm. that was yeah. Andre Previn. <laughs> <laughs> and that yeah. was Shelly Mann on percussion. Shelly Mann, yeah. Shelly Mann, he had a, he had, I believe he had a uh, jazz place downtown, Shelly Mann's Hole, they call Manhole, it. Manhole, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. But, but it was, um, uh, you, you know, I was like in awe of these people because I'm a big jazz fan. Right. In fact, I'm, I'm, I am a, a Jeff's musician, you know, having gone to Juilliard for a quick cup of coffee. I didn't last too long, but <laughs> <laughs> it's a good thing because yeah. uh, I never could have made yeah. it. And we also, you, you said this to me while we were watching the movie, we also heard your voice at one point in the movie. <laughs> Tell him about that. Uh, well, th th that was just uh, when, when, when Sterling Hayden went to the wrong door of the mm -hmm. motel and there was somebody inside that said, who is it? That was me. <laughs> <laughs> the wrestler that starts the fight. Now, this was a most unusual. Cola. Coriani. Coriani. And you, his line readings, you really had to lean forward to understand. In fact, when I did the commentary on the 4K release of The Killing, I had to keep freeze framing it and going back to try and make sure I understood exactly what he was saying. But... One of the things about Stanley is he met him in a chess club and, and was a great chess player, correct? Yeah, that was Stanley's friend from the 42nd Street Chess Club in New York. Yeah. He, he, he brought him out, uh, you know, to, for that part. I can't remember whether, whether the, the, it probably wasn't in the book. No, I think he was, he was added. And I think the, the main thing is that you guys stuck with the structure of Clean Break, where it jumped around from flashback and out of sequence time. And that was kind of a challenge because uh, initially the folks at UA didn't, didn't go along with that. No, that, no, 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 no. Or was it the audience reaction? No, it was, it was when we finished the picture and we screened it for, for the sneak preview and, and for our friends and everything. Right. Everybody to the, to, down to the last person said that we should recut the picture and make it a straight line story. Mm -hmm. That the flashbacks were irritating and, and that you're teasing people and it's going to get them hostile and, the, and, and you're going to get bad word of mouth Hard to and, believe. and everything. <laughs> and, and you know, if enough people tell you you're sick, you should lie down. You know? <laughs> And, and Good point. And so we, we, we were disturbed by this because we, we figured 
you know, we love the structure of the book. Uh, it's absolutely. one of the reasons that, that we thought it was, it was so outstanding. Mm -hmm. Anyway, we took the film back to New York before we delivered it to United Artists. Mm -hmm. uh, we went. We rented an editing room mm -hmm. at 1600 Broadway, and and we tried to to recut it. Mm -hmm. And we got like halfway through it and looked at each other and said, w "You know, what on earth are we doing?" <laughs> the, the, the whole idea, uh, the thing that we liked so much about the about the book, mm -hmm. and the way the story was told. Uh, and we're, and we're now even thinking about abandoning that. Mm -hmm. If we if we're going to fail, we should fail with our own ideas. You know, we shouldn't correct. You know, worry about what other people thought. Right. Uh, and so we kept it as just as you s saw it and delivered it to United Artists. They didn't ke they didn't think much of the of the film. Right. Right. They really didn't. They they're so right. busy with big pictures and things that. They were just Billy Wilder, et cetera. All yeah. kinds of, of, of yeah. They, yeah. Uh, yeah. It was just another film yeah. to them. But I did, I did like the changes that that I guess uh, Jim Thompson and Stanley made, like the 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 change in the characters. Like in the book, the Marvin Unger character played by J. C. Flippen is like this kind of uh, cantankerous, embittered old man. And in the movie, he's turned into this kind of lonely, nebbish kind of guy. And, you know, you guys gave him like a, a pocket print protector with all these pens in it and so on and so forth. And uh, I, I really liked what, what uh, was done with all the characters because all of the characters, even the shortest vignettes, had, had some sort of depth to them where you had an understanding of where, who the person was, where they were coming from. You know, I, you know, I noticed... That when Sterling uh, did the robbery at, at the racetrack, mm -hmm. and and after the robbery was complete, mm -hmm. he, he 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 took off his jacket, right. took off his jacket, and and uh, and tore and the shirt off, tore the shirt off, and right. and, and then when the next time we saw him at the at the motel, mm -hmm. he had a tie on. <laughs> Script, script supervisor missed a continuity yeah. check there. Something absolutely, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. I, I, yeah, I, yeah. You know, you, you see, but a lot of people don't notice things like that if your story's good. You know, that's true. You, yeah, that's so true. Michael Curtiz used to say when they say this doesn't make sense, he'd say, "Don't worry, I make it go so fast they won't notice." <laughs> yeah. Uh, a few words on Timothy Carey <laughs> because he. Uh, I mean, you. You subsequently had him in Paths of Glory, and I think, uh, unfortunately for Tim, you ended up sending him home from Germany when you were filming over there with Kirk Douglas. But um, uh, a long time ago, we had Andre de Toth at the Egyptian Theater. I think Eddie was there, and we showed Crime Wave that had Carrie at one point was in the middle of a two-shot making faces. And uh, I, de Toth was asked, what about Timothy? And he goes... What you see is what you get. Uh, so, what was what was your uh, what was the Timothy Carey experience for you? Well, you could see uh, e even as early as the killing that that he's a, a scene stealer. Yes, that he tries to create different things that that yeah. were not in the rehearsal. Right. To get away with it. Yeah. Uh, oh yeah. Oh yeah. And uh, he uh, makes faces. Mm -hmm. and, and and you know his teeth yeah you know, and, and, right, yeah but you know with guys like that you only have to get it once you know in making right. movies it's not like a stage play where you have to do it mm -hmm. every day and right. two matinees mm -hmm. uh you just get it once and and mm -hmm. he's he's really terrific mm -hmm. he's really terrific he's on, unique he's uh, unique, yeah no doubt about but, it but but he 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 tries to create attention for himself of course, and, <laughs> and very successfully. And, I, I, <laughs> and, I'm, and I'm past the glory. He he just went too far. Right. And he 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 staged. I believe he staged that he he denies it, but he staged it, that he was kidnapped. <laughs> and, and the police found him tied up on on the street some somewhere on a highway, and and he he claimed he was kidnapped and, and yeah. for a ransom. Uh, which was totally untrue. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> and and he, he he just made such a fuss over it. I mm -hmm. talked the police into at least until the thing was settled. Let him go back to work because mm -hmm. you know we we got a picture to shoot and right. a schedule and a budget and all that problem. Mm -hmm. 
and uh, he, he 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 just would not go back. To, we, we we went back to the to the set, mm-hmm. and uh, the police wanted him to sign a statement. Mm-hmm. Of, of uh, and he kept revising it, you know, and <laughs> revision after revision, <laughs> script revisions. Uh, and, and I said, you know, everybody's waiting, mm-hmm. I, and and it's it's bad psychological. You know, you've got some real heavyweight actors. Right. You know, well, that was that was your beginning of Stanley's association with with Kirk Douglas. Yeah, I mean, we had right. Kirk uh, Douglas, and we had uh, Adolf Manjou and George McCready, and yeah. Ralph Meeker, and and uh, did, did, one of the perhaps arguably the greatest war film ever made. You could make a case for Paths of Glory for those of you who have seen then, it. It's a great one of the great films. And Wayne Morris. And uh, Wayne Morris, who yeah. was great in that. So, yeah. so all these people are waiting. Yeah. Because we need Tim, mm-hmm. Gary, and and I said, Tim, if you don't sign that that, mm-hmm. that thing for the police and get back to work, I'm going to have to let you go. Well, mm-hmm. yeah, he 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 challenged me, mm-hmm. and and I couldn't let the picture start falling apart because of this. Yeah, one guy. I mean, I loved him. I mean, he just yeah, you know, but he he just went too far. Right. Actually, right. I did a film back in 1980 called Fast Walking, mm-hmm. of which I, I used him again. <laughs> and the first scene he was in, he had b- in, the f- in the story, he had been thrown off the prison, like a, a, the mm-hmm. fourth tier, mm-hmm. and he was dead on the floor mm-hmm. of, of the prison. Right. And we were shooting him as a dead man. Right. And he's still doing shtick. On the, on the <laughs> <laughs> you you got to so, you gotta love that. So, so uh, the killing, then paths of glory, and then you said Lolita was was the first birth thing. But there came a time where you felt you had to go out on your own as as a filmmaker. Uh, how did you come to that decision, and how did that affect, if it did, your relationship with with Kubrick? Oh, it didn't affect the relationship at all because he was. He, <laughs> It wasn't that he was glad to get rid of me. I mean, he he <laughs> he, he uh, uh, gave me his blessing. I mean, he always thought that I should be a director. Mm-hmm. That the that the most uh, fulfilling part of filmmaking is for the director. Because right. when you look at the at the at the dailies or what's up on the screen, you put it there. Mm-hmm. And he felt it's that, you on the screen. And and he felt I made enough contributions to the three films that we did together, plus the development of Doctor Strangelove. Mm-hmm. We were going to do that as a straight line story, as right. a, as with, with no right. comedy. I mean, as a straight, right. serious drama. Mm-hmm. And and once I had arranged the financing for that, mm-hmm. I felt that this was my time. Stanley now had the financing to do, to Edge of Doom, it was called, mm-hmm. and I made a deal for, for the financing. Mm-hmm. And I, uh, I said, I, I just have to, I just have to try my hand at directing, mm-hmm. which which he in, encouraged. Mm-hmm. So I went back to the to the West Coast. And uh, and Stanley uh, met a guy named Terry Southern, right. to, to, uh, and and I got a call from Stanley a couple of weeks later, and he said, you know, I met a guy named named Terry Southern, who I had never heard of. <laughs> he had written books like The Magic Christian, and right. he said, you know, we decided that that the story is best told as a comedy. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and, and I said, Jesus Christ. <laughs> Leave this guy alone for ten minutes, <laughs> and he's going to go right down the crapper. You know, <laughs> I, right. I I just felt that. I mean, we had such a good story. You know, we took yeah. a big trade ad, the double truck trade ad, double truck trade ad with our next Harris Kubrick movie is going to be Edge of Doom. You know, the big <laughs> thermonuclear confrontation. Right. And he's going to turn it into a a com a black comedy. Well. This is I'm giving it to you straight. Yeah. This is my favorite Kubrick film. You Do- know, Doctor Strange. Doctor Strange. I think that that is an absolute That's, work of genius. It is. It is. And, and it is. It is. It is. And <laughs> maybe I left too soon. You know? <laughs> <laughs> no. Well, I, I remember one of your films that made a, a good impression on me. It certainly didn't encourage me to join the Navy. Was the Bedford incident <laughs> yeah, well, with with Sidney Poitier and Richard Widmark, which was a terrific film. Well, that was the, the, my first uh, time directing. Right, and it's I, I, want, I really I don't know if there are any, asper, any aspiring filmmakers in the audience, but I'm sure there is. Yeah, but yeah. the thing is that, as I said before, casting is everything. Mm-hmm. And and in addition to that, 
I think that, that previously published material is so important mm -hmm. in, in my view. I think that not enough credit is given to the authors of the, of the books that films are based on. Right. I mean, when you look at it, they did all the heavy lifting. That's right. They, they came up with the, the, the story. Mm -hmm. They came up with the characters. Mm -hmm. uh, yep. They did all the research that's necessary. What did I know about the Navy? Yep. Nothing. I was in the Army. <laughs> you yeah. know, I did, incidentally, I did a lot of fighting mm -hmm. during the Korean War. I fought really hard, but they took me anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Jimmy, I think you also have a growth industry in stand-up comedy or sit-down <laughs> comedy. It's one of your talents that, ha that we're exploit you're exploiting here tonight. Well... <laughs> You know, I always said that, that a good producer and a talented director should go hand in hand. Right. But not around the studio. <laughs> <laughs> that doesn't look good. <laughs> oh, so uh, to, 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 uh, to put a bow on this, in, in looking back, uh, you, stayed, you and Stanley stayed friends till the end of his life. Yeah. And looking back, sitting here 68 years uh, ago watching the movie that you made, I kind of said to you, this looked like you had fun doing this. Was it fun? No. Was, it wasn't? No. <laughs> <laughs> so much for my ending. <laughs> you no, know, uh, making movies is not fun. It's yeah, only fun it's work. if you've made a good one. Right. It's only fun if you've made a good one because making it, you're under a, a, a budget and you're under Stress. a schedule. And, and you've got a completion bond to deal mm -hmm. with, and you've got uh, working with crazy actors. <laughs> Mo most actors are crazy you know? yeah. <laughs> and insecure. And, right. And, and it's so difficult to really mm -hmm. to... And it takes so much of... of, of, of I mean, everything has to go right. And, mm -hmm. and all your dreams, you can only get really achieve about 80% of what you've set out to do. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, you've got weather complications. You've got mm -hmm. uh, actors not knowing their lines or getting sick. or, or well, it's, There's so many things that can... Go can, wrong. Can, and, you know, a couple of bad scenes in the pictures is a loser. Mm -hmm. You know, it just doesn't work. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, a lot, of, a lot of pictures are terrible, but they make a lot of money. I mean, True. It's tough to... I, I don't know how you can put definitions on what's good, what's bad, yeah. you know, what's... Well, I, I certainly think that this picture tonight, the killing, was well above 80%, pretty close to 100%. And I think the 100% and the cherry on top, Jimmy, it was having you here for this. And I'm glad I called you 68 years. So put it together for Jimmy Harris. Thank you so much. Thank you.